So I think we're about ready to get started. Hello and welcome. My name is Susan Roll. I'm the Director of Civic Engagement for the campus. And we are so happy that you're here tonight. <clears throat> I ran into the president, Hutchinson, coming out of Kendall Hall tonight as I was heading over. And she said, Susan, where are you going? And I said, the candidate forum, of course. She said, oh, I'm sorry to miss it, but tell everybody that we're so glad that they're here. And we want people to keep coming back and coming back. We're so happy to be a university that can host and welcome you all to be a part of this discussion with us tonight. We want to continue to be an open and welcoming institution for everyone. One thing that we did recently is we installed a wildcat statue that you may have seen. It's right out in front of here. And she is looking out into the community. And that's on purpose, because we want to be sure that we are constantly connecting with our community that is so important and integral to this university. So we really can't say enough how glad we are that you're here. And we're so grateful to host this event with the League of Women Voters, who has been just uh, 100 years now, by the way. The League of Women Voters will be 100 years next year. We are so grateful for them across the country and of course here locally for providing these amazing opportunities for us to all get educated about democracy. It's really such an important service and I'm really grateful that they're partnering here with us tonight and we look forward to many more. So I'm gonna hand this over to Carol Burr who's gonna give you the layout of how this is all gonna go tonight and uh, we look forward to your questions and responses, thanks. Thank you, Susan. And thank you for coming, yeah. Well, the League of Women Voters uh, is very happy you're here. You know, it's Constitution Day, which seems to me a reminder of why we all are here, doing our civic duty and, and being grateful to people who are willing to run for office. It's turning out to be, you know, kind of industrial strength work. Um, it's the intent of the League to provide an opportunity for candidates to present their views on important issues facing voters. And one way for the candidates to do that is Voter's Edge. So if you haven't gotten onto Voter's Edge and gotten your information up there, we're coming after you. Because we want everybody to know all, all about you. We're committed to fair and unbiased forums, and the rules are designed to maintain that respected tradition. Voter information about all races, candidates, and ballot measures can be found at the Voter's Edge. Tonight's forum is being live streamed on YouTube, recorded by BCAC TV, and it will be broadcast in its entirety on Comcast Channel 11, Tuesdays and Thursdays at 9 and Saturdays at 6 p.m. until the election on the 6th of November. So all you need to do, you can go to the League website, lwvbuttecounty.org, and that'll give you a link and get you where you need to go to see how fantastic these people were tonight. Uh, we allow audio and video of these forums only in their entirety, and they are not to be used for any other purpose. Okay, so we had a drawing for the order of the opening statements and for the closing statements, and they're seated in the order of the opening statements. Um, all the questions need to be addressed to all of the candidates, and we encourage you to submit those questions on the index cards that you were given. Uh, just raise your hand and one of our runners will come and get your card up to the sorters, our trusty sorters over here. You may realize we have a large group of people here and so we will not be able to get to all the questions, to put it mildly, uh, but we will try to uh, cover as much as we can in the time that we have. Um, and the media, we're very grateful to have the Chico News and Review and the Chico Enterprise Record um, print media. You know, we love it, don't we? We even want the Gridley Herald back. Yeah. So, because this forum is nonpartisan, we ask that you not uh, bring any campaign materials in here and just hold your applause and your cheers and your boos or whatever you're feeling like doing until uh, we have a, a, a all the way to the end of the forum and then we can applaud. So, off we go. I'm happy to say that we have two outstanding moderators who are going to be asking the questions of the, of the uh, candidates, Claire Green and Mahaley Allen. Let's the game begins. Good evening. The Chico City Council is composed of seven council members elected to staggered four-year terms. 
there is an election each November of even numbered years with either three or four seats up for election. In cases where a council member is an, unable to complete a term, the council can appoint a replacement, but that position will be subject to a vote at the next general election. The council selects a mayor and vice mayor from among its members to serve two-year terms. The mayor presides over the council meetings, which are held on the first and third Tuesday of each month. Normally, council meetings begin at 6 p.m. in the city council chamber at 421 Main Street. Meetings also are televised live on cable channel 11. The council establishes and adopts the policies for the city, and one of its major functions is the review and adoption of the city budget. Council members receive $600 a month, which is set by state law, with the mayor receiving an additional $120 for his or her extra duties. They also receive a $75 cell phone allowance and can also receive health insurance benefits. There are three vacancies and nine candidates. Andrew Coolidge, Matt Galloway, Casey Reynolds, Alex Brown, Richard Ober, Scott Huber, Ken Rinsink, John Aguire, and John Scott. Eight of them are with us tonight. Now for the ground rules. Each candidate will be given one minute for an opening statement, one minute to respond to each question, and one minute to make a closing statement. Assisting us this evening are two timekeepers. There are holding signs marked with one minute, 30 seconds, and 15 seconds in stop. Candidates, please abide by the time limitations. The media, the league, and the audience will present questions. Representing the press, are Steve Schoonover from the Chico Enterprise Record and Asia Shiraga from the Chico News and Review. We encourage members of the audience to use the cards available from league staff to submit a question. Please raise your hand if you would like a card. When you have written your question, raise the card and a staffer will pick it up and bring it to the question sorters. who will select, combine, and give them to the moderators. Our time with the candidates for the Chico City Council will be approximately one and a half hours. Please hold your applause until we have thanked the candidates for their participation at the end of the forum. It's now time for opening statements. Candidate Rinsink, you may begin with your one minute opening statement. Thank you for providing this forum. You know, Chico is an awesome community. I've traveled around the country. I've visited lots of cities in 43 different states. And I gotta tell you, very few cities can compete with Chico with everything that we have here. We have an awesome community and I want to help keep it an awesome community. Uh, a big issue for me is civil public discourse. We haven't seen a lot of that recently. We haven't seen it in the city council in the last few weeks. We saw candidate Casey Reynolds, business and her campaign signs were vandalized over the weekend. All political leaders need to stand up and say this is unacceptable, it's wrong, and we don't allow it here in our city and community of Chico. Uh, you know, free speech means you've got the right to say whatever you want to whoever you want. But free speech also means the other person's got the same right to say what they want. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Oh, hello, everybody. I'm John Scott. Uh, I came to Chico 40 years ago on a motorcycle. I had a little more hair on my head then than I do now. Um, I fell in love with this community. Um, I've raised a family here. I've had several businesses here. Uh, it's been an awesome place and it's been an awesome life. And now I want to contribute in every way that I know how to keep it an awesome place and an awesome life for my children. So tonight we're going to talk about some issues. And uh, I, I hope that uh, I can provide clarity as to my position on those issues. Thank you for your time. On where we move. Ms. Brown. Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you to the League for hosting this forum and allowing us the opportunity to speak about our qualifications and our policy priorities. I'm Alex Brown. I moved to Chico 10 years ago to start my career at Chico State. Uh, earned two bachelor's degrees, one in multicultural and gender studies and one in psychology, and then went on to pursue and receive my master's degree in social work. 
My background is primarily in social services, and I have looked at the issues facing our community from a variety of lenses. From a direct service perspective, providing counseling and advocacy for people in need, to a prevention perspective, looking long-term at the solutions that are viable for our community, to an administrative perspective as an administrator at Chico State, implementing policy and working with a variety of stakeholders to address the issues facing our city. I'm excited to apply those skills to the Chico City Council level and to provide leadership in a strategic and sustainable way. Thanks again for having me, and I'll look forward to talking with you more. Ms. Reynolds. Hi, I'm Casey Reynolds. Um, I'm local. Chico owner of uh, Schubert's Ice Cream and Candy. I'm fourth generation Chico. Um, I'm a mom with five kids, two grandkids, three dogs, and all that kind of good stuff. Um, I too would like to um, shout out what Ken said then, and for my opening speech, it has been a little bit of a rough weekend, and uh, you are not kidding when you talk about industrial strength. I got to get out my industrial strength cleaning skills this weekend, doing some pressure washing and uh, working on my signs. So. Um, we can all agree to disagree. We can have civil discourse, um, but I would just like to encourage um, everybody to just bring the political tone down a notch. Let's come together. Let's come to a table. Let's learn how to talk about stuff, share ideas, and um, it's only going to be by us uniting together as a community that we can get anywhere to healing and fixing the problems in this community. Thank you. Mr. Ober. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, I want to thank the League of Women Voters, uh, Chico State, my fellow candidates. It's a, a journey that we're on together. And most importantly, all of you for being with us tonight. I'm asking tonight for your support and your vote because we know that it's only through collaborative leadership, engaged dialogue, and a true sense of working together on common solutions to complex problems that we can move forward. That's the kind of person I am in my DNA. That's the leadership that I'll bring to the council, and I'm looking forward to talking about the issues tonight. Thank you all. Mr. Huber. Thank you. Chico's been my home and my passion since the 1970s. I had the good fortune to meet my love, lovely love of my life, raise my kids here. Um, I've also had the opportunity to fulfill a number of leadership roles in the community. I served as the president of the Association of Realtors in 2002. Uh, I served on the Chico School Board from 2002 to 2006, and I was the president of Alta Cal Audubon Society for a number of years. I too have uh, noted the um, sort of the polarization of the city council, and that's what I'd like to cure. My goals are uh, respect, civility, openness, inclusiveness, transparency, and empathy. Those are what I'd like to practice in the campaign, and that's what I'll bring to the city council. Thank you very much. Mr. Galloway. Good evening, and thanks, everybody, for coming tonight. It's great to see your faces out there. I um, am Matt Galloway. I'm a native of Chico, proud product of our schools here in Chico. I attended Neil Dow, Bidwell, Pleasant Valley, before heading off to Berkeley and getting a degree, earning my degree in architecture. That was uh, 28 years ago. For the last 28 years, I have been both an employee and an employer of 20 in our community. This community made me what I am. We've come to love our community and we love the beauty, but we've also seen in, in, in recent years some deterioration of that beauty, especially with regards to crime and, and homeless. I really want to work hard to, main, to, give the, to give the tools that our staff needs for a safe, affordable, and attractive Chico. Thank you. Mr. Coolidge. Well, I'd like to thank the League of Women Voters in California State University. It's always good to be back at my alma mater. Um, I'm a proud graduate of Chico State, but I will not tell you how many years ago. Um, I am a current council member, a, a longtime business owner in the city of Chico, and also obviously a longtime Chico resident. Um, over the last four years, I've fought for public safety, fiscal responsibility, restoring our fire department to recommended staffing levels, and uh, also have led the fight to preserve Chico's history, 
leading the charge on the save the Esplanade, uh, saving the water towers in Chico, and also uh, other historic elements of our city. So thank you for having us here tonight. Thank you, candidates. Steve Schoonover from the Chico Enterprise Record will ask the first question. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of what happened at the last council meeting. Uh, for those of you who aren't, there was a planned disturbance, uh, the chambers were cleared, and the council proceeded to take action without the public present. I'm interested in your um, opinions on what happened there, the whole process. It's, this isn't a question about sit lie, it's a question about, about removing the, the, the disturbance, removing the public from the meeting, and continuing in the empty chambers. I, I'm sure you all know what happened. If you're not, you probably shouldn't be sitting up there. <laughs> Thank you for the responses. We'll start with Mr. Scott. So um, if, if I heard you correctly, you're looking for uh, my opinion on what took place at the last city council meeting. And the reality of it is, is that you can have diverse opinions, but you know, we have to follow rules. If we've got one person in the back of the building screaming, nobody else is gonna be able to get their opinion through. Even here, before we started this, this event, the rules were laid out. No clapping until the end, no jumping up and down, yelling and screaming, quietly and respectfully hear every candidate's view. That's not what took place at the last city council meeting. You had people behaving very uh, disruptively their opinions may or may not have value. That's not what's at debate. What's at debate is behaving properly so that everybody can air their opinion. So uh, for those who didn't behave properly, shame on you. Um, I hope that makes my opinion pretty clear. <laughs> Ms. Brown. So I, I absolutely believe in, in respect and civility and, and treating the leaders of our community with that respect and civility. Um, as a city councilor um, in the seat, uh, while something like this were to happen, um, you know, it is the, I would, I would look to the mayor to maintain order in this situation and I would follow suit. Um, it's clear to me that people in our community don't feel like their voices are being heard. And as a city councilor, I would make it a priority to ensure um, a, an approach that invites all people to come to the table and voice their opinions about the issues that matter to them um, and addressing those issues and concerns as they come up. Ms. Reynolds. Um, I absolutely uh, think it's very, very sad where we have come and that our city council meetings have come to that level. Um, we all have a degree. We all got our one minute to speak up there. And I think you should honor your minute that you have and respectfully listen to others that have a different opinion. Um, nobody should be afraid to come up to that podium or should be chided or should be called out by name while you're standing up there trying to make your point. Everybody's point is valid. Everybody's point, um, you may or may not agree with it, but you should listen. And sometimes when I, somebody said one time we got two ears and one mouth for a reason because we should listen twice as much as we speak. Um, so I think if we practice that while we're in our meetings and listen to the other people that we might be able to come together and come up with some solutions and um, have some more civility in our meetings. Mr. Ober. I think, I think um, this question actually goes to the core of, of why I got into this race and that is improving the tone of our civil discourse. It's also a question about leadership. When we have an environment where people in our community feel that the only way to get their voices heard is to be disruptive and to force the mayor's hand into doing his or her job and maintaining order, then we have a breakdown in, um, in our core system. And it's a question of, of what we value and how we're going to maintain those values in the civic space. So I think that this is a large question that has to do with how we're going to build relationship and build spaces where people can be heard and feel empowered to have their voices listened to, as well as a space where order is maintained and everybody's voice can be heard. What we saw on, at that meeting, uh, that did not happen. I think the, the mayor took the right uh, approach. Unfortunately, that was the approach that had to be taken. 
Mr. Huber. So we candidates, have we ask that all candidates please sit during their answers. Thank okay. you. Sure. Um, so we had a meeting uh, about four or five months ago where a similar incident occurred. And during the time that the council took the break and went in the back room and called a recess because of the, because of the uh, disturbance, I stood up in the middle of the room and I said, would everybody please withhold your comments and your disruptive behavior because there's a lot of us here that want to speak this evening and we can't possibly get what we want to say out if you keep doing what you're doing. And I was very gratified to get an email from Mayor Morgan later that week thanking me for that and I, I really appreciated getting that from him. I very much agree that our meetings have to be civil. I think that there is a certain faction of people that come to our meetings that don't really have an interest in solving something. I think they have an interest in um, just making a little bit of trouble. So one idea that I have going forward, uh, I got the stop sign, so I'll have to tell you later. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Galloway. So I think it's important to note that there are rules and processes at those meetings. There was a public hearing and everybody had their opportunity to be heard. Unfortunately, there were so many people speaking that night, it was only a minute. That, that's unfortunate, but it was an equal opportunity for everybody to speak at that time. The public hearing had closed at the time that the disruption started to occur, and it was surreal to, sit at, to, to be able to watch that after the fact. I was actually working that night. But, but to be able to watch that after the fact and think of, you know, in, in 30 years of, of uh, watching those things in Chico, never seen anything like that. So I, I think, again, we need to all be thinking that we're playing by the same rules. We need to be able to hear so that we can conduct the business of our government. We're all there, we're all running because we think we have an opportunity to be effective. If a, a few silent, or if a, if a few uh, loud minority reach out and interrupt, we can't do that. Thank you. Mr. Coolidge. Thank you. Um, I know all too well, uh, sitting on the dais, how that transpired. And I have to say that democracy can only work if we all come together and listen to all sides and allow each other to speak and take our turns and put forward what we think are the best arguments. I did actually say something like that at the council meeting. Unfortunately, it did fall upon deaf, deaf ears in, in some respects. Um, but I do think it is important, and I think it's important for all our council members, all our candidates, to come forward and say that they believe public discourse should happen in a clear, concise, fair, and equal way in which everybody has a chance to speak. Thank you. Mr. Rensink. Thank you. Yes, what happened a couple of weeks ago was, I think, very unfortunate from anybody's perspective. It's very important for everyone, everyone in the community to have their say and their input. But like many of my colleagues have mentioned, it can't just be a free for all. We have to have rules and procedures as to how we go about discussing issues, even the contentious ones. And it's very important to recognize that, you know, your rights end where the next person's rights begin. And if you're up shouting and taking over the public space, then you're violating the rights of other people who showed up. And we need to respect everyone's rights. Thank you. Thank you. Asia Shiraga from the News and Review will ask the next question. Thank you. Uh, my question is, are you supportive of any new local taxes to boost city revenue? We will begin with Ms. Brown. Good for you. Yes, certain and certain taxes. Um, I think that the the current gas tax that's in place um, should maintain and should stay in place because I'm happy to pay for the repairs to the roads that I drive on. 
Um, I think that if we open our city up to the possibility of commerce around cannabis, that there are some effective taxing systems that we can put in place to, um, to build revenue and to uh, address other issues that are facing our community. Um, I would need to and want to learn more about the other possibilities, and I think that there's an opportunity here for our, our citizens to invest in the wellness of our community through those opportunities. And um, as they came to the table, I would be thoughtful in my consideration of them. Ms. Reynolds. I'm not sure in a local tax review if you're speaking of a specialized tax. Um, would, is that what you're? I, I just wanted to hear kind of, you know, you could go anywhere you wanted with it, you know, okay. just kind of your thoughts on, on okay. a question like that. Yeah, I think uh, it's definitely, but we've done bonds, we've done taxes. Um, if I was going to support um, a tax increase of any kind, I would want to make sure that it was going to exactly what the enhanced revenue is being um, put towards. A lot of times we see taxes and things come on and then they just get absorbed into the general budget and become um, not used for what they were raised for. And so if I was going to be in support of doing an additional tax, I would want to make sure that it was going ex to what it was raised for. Mr. Ober. Um, yeah, I think that, that this is a matter of when you're approaching a problem, um, do you bring your entire toolkit to that solution, or do you limit yourself and say, I'm only going to use one or two of the tools to try to address the problem? I think that some of the um, tax possibilities and revenue generating possibilities that have been um, proposed, including by uh, the Chico Chamber of Commerce, are things that ought to be tools that are available to us. Whether they are the right ones to use in a particular circumstance, that's you know down in the, the details that we'll, we'll deal with at that time. But, but uh, yes, I do think that we ought to have all of those tools available to us. I do think that looking at revenue from uh, uh, well-regulated cannabis sales is one tool. I think that uh, the possibility of other kinds of taxes are other tools. And so I think we ought to be open to all the tools when we're addressing um, the situation with the budget that we're addressing now. Mr. Huber. Well, starting off with the repeal of the gas tax, um, it would be absolutely disastrous to our roads if the gas tax is repealed. Um, we are at the point now that we've lost all the RDA money that we used to have. We're $188 million in arrears on road repair. The money that comes in from the gas tax is the only thing that's keeping our roads in the condition that they're in right now. So I hope everyone will take that to heart when you consider voting on the, on the uh, repeal of the um, gas tax. Um, I won't say that I am supportive of any particular tax, but I'm certainly not close-minded to any tax. There was a conversation that happened at the city council last month where it was a motion was made to have a discussion of all the different options for taxes that we might consider to repair our roads and take care of our infrastructure. That was declined to go forward by the city council, which is a shame because it limited our options for fixing the problem. Mr. Galloway. So I would start by pointing out that California is the most taxed and regulated state in the nation. So I always look for an alternative measure before proposing a new tax. I would like to commend our council for the in the last four years, I've been meeting with a city manager as an architect in Chico monthly for the last 10 years. In the last six years of that, there was a number in his chalkboard in the corner, $15 million four years ago the, in the debt. As recently as last April, that number was in the black and we're starting to make a little bit of money. In four years, we've seen $17 million in change from $15 million deficit to $2 million in, in the black. I commend Andrew as, as one of the members working for, towards that. With that in mind, before I would propose a new tax in any way, I, I would suggest that we continue to look at places that we can save within our government. I'm intimately aware of some of the decisions that have been made with regards to positions I think we can do better. Mr. Coolidge. So California has one of the highest uh, gas taxes in the entire nation, if not in the entire world, and uh, some of the worst roads. Um, the link is not necessarily clear. What is clear and what makes sense is 
strong, strict financial management that moves our city forward and gives us enough money to adequately, first off, bring in businesses by showing them we are business friendly, and secondly, by ensuring that we do not increase funds when we don't need them. We are, again, one of the most taxed states in the United States, and we find ourselves um, often losing companies or money to other cities where, or outside of California, that are more attractive to businesses. So I believe that as we can bring in businesses, keep our taxes low, that Chico will profit because of that, and that has proven out over the last several years. Mr. Rensing. Thank you. Uh, the state has a sales tax of seven and a quarter percent, and the city of Chico adds another half percent for seven and three quarters. If you go and look at the range of tax rates for cities across the state, it runs from around uh, seven, and a, seven and a quarter up to as high as 11 percent for the total city taxes. If you look at communities similar to Chico and their tax rates, their tax rates are similar to ours or a touch higher, like around 8 percent. Streets, roads, parks, services cost money. Yes, we are in a high-tax state, but we all have to decide, are we willing to spend the amount of money that's necessary to provide the services that we all say we want? And I think we ought to be open to looking at all possibilities, including raising some taxes selectively, if that's what it takes to pay for the services we all agree we would like. Thank you. Mr. Scott. I'm disappointed that I didn't hear my other the other candidates here speak about what the real problem is. You've got out of control pensions. It doesn't matter how many taxes we have. We can raise all the taxes. It's not going to change the fact that we are headed to a pension crisis where we'll reach a point where every single dollar that we collect in revenue goes for unfunded pensions and then we don't have anything left. So there's, we have no business talking about new taxes until we talk about the real underlying problem the pension crisis. Without solving that, we could double the revenue of Chico tomorrow, and all it does is put off the day where we have a complete breakdown because there's no money left for anything other than unfunded pensions. Let's talk about what the real problem is instead of about beating around the bush of another half a percent uh, sales tax or the gas tax. We have a pension problem, and it's about to explode, and that's what we need to be talking about. Thank you. Thank you. Now a question from the audience. Do you approve of a reinstatement of the sit lie or other ordinances primarily affecting homeless individuals in Chico? We will start with Ms. Reynolds. Um, I do support the reenactment of sit and lie. I stood up and spoke about it in the uh, city council meeting last week, which led to probably what happened last weekend. But um, I, if you look at the numbers, it was used, what, 243 times in three years. Um, no, not one single person ever went to jail from it. 70% um, of the people that are asked to move on, either by myself or by a police officer or somebody else, move on. But sometimes for people that aren't going to go and that are going to be obstinate and create a problem and make it to where I can't run my business or somebody else can't run their business. Sometimes you need something else to encourage them. It also gives police officers the ability to engage with these people and they've sometimes been able to encourage them to go into services and to help get them some of the things that they need. Um, I as a citizen can go and talk to this person anytime but police can't. So it also gives them that legal authority to help um, maybe encourage them to go a different direction. Mr. Ober. <clears throat> no, I don't support uh, re-upping on sit lie. A very credible study, the data is there for us, a very credible study conducted by Chico State established that sit lie oh, and, and the years around it cost uh, approximately $800,000, north of $800,000. And what we got for that $800,000 is moving people into the park, in further north into our neighborhoods. We simply moved people along. We didn't provide any services. We didn't have any additional beds. 
And so $800,000 really got us nothing, and I don't know why we would return to that and do it all over again. Coincidentally, the budget for the Torres Shelter, I've been on the board of the directors there for four years, uh, for one year of services, housing 160 people a night, 365 days a year, is a bit north of $800,000. I ask, where as a community do we really think that money should go? I say it should go to services. Mr. Huber. So it's worth revisiting the fact that the, Dep the Federal Department of Justice declared sit and lie unconstitutional in a case in Boise, Idaho a few years back. Um, we risk losing COC, continuum of care funds, by, having, by going against something that's been declared uh, illegal by the federal government. The COC has a point system. They take points away from cities who criminalize homelessness. In their eyes, this is criminalizing homelessness. So it doesn't help us with the challenge that we have. The solution to getting people out of downtown is, I believe, a day center where people can go during the day, somewhere where they can rest, they can have services there, they can get help with their physical ailments, that sort of thing. That's the solution that can move people away from the downtown. Mr. Galloway. I did support sit and lie. If for no other reason, our, our police chief and our police department are asking, are, they're begging us for tools to help. It's not the only tool, clearly. There's, there's many tools that we, need to, um, that we need to get in place. Some of them may be law enforcement related, but others are just having a, a um, consolidated service program and, and different programs through either the Jesus Center or the Tory Shelter or otherwise. But if for no other reason, our police department's looking to us for assistance with tools, if for no other reason, I support that in a way that needs to be legal. Right? I, I think even the council, as they proceeded, want to make sure that we're legal and, and proceeding properly with this. I, I think it's funny on one hand to say that I don't support the sit and lie because it may make us ineligible for funds, and the same logic could apply to cannabis. Cannabis will put us in, in equally problem, equal problems. Mr. Coolidge. So I actually agendized both the sit and lie ordinance and the shelter <clears throat> crisis declaration, and I'm proud to have done it. I think the solution lies in all solutions, in working towards answers on all the issues. I brought forth the Chico Safe Now initiatives, and I believe that these are the most reasonable things our community can do. Approve Simplicity Village, approve the sit lie ordinance, have reasonable park closure times, have a reasonable shopping cart ordinance and relative to our shopping uh, to our stores, added protection for our parks and playgrounds, as well as keeping our street crimes unit. And I would like to see, and I believe the council is moving in that direction, and I think that'll be very beneficial for our city. Mr. Rensink. Thank you. So what's the purpose of a sidewalk? The sidewalk is to allow pedestrian traffic to travel the public spaces in a safe and efficient manner. If you allow people to sit, lie, and obstruct, sidewalks, then you're negating the purpose of having sidewalks in the first place. Now, there's been reference to the court decision that said sit lie ordinance was illegal. That is true, but there was a caveat. My understanding is they said it was illegal if there weren't enough beds available for all the homeless. And it seems like that last part has been left out in a lot of the discussion. So for me, the solution seems that we should be driving towards A, providing enough beds for all the homeless in Chico and supporting the Butte County Continuum of Care to reach that. And then I think we won't need a set lie ordinance because there won't be people looking to be sleeping on the sidewalk if they have another place to sleep. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Well, I absolutely, without question, support the sit and lie ordinance. I've noticed that the sit and lie ordinance doesn't pick a particular class of people. It is not about your, 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 how well you're doing or how well you're not doing. It's about behavior. The sidewalk is for walking. Chairs are for sitting. And, you know, if, if anybody here thinks that, that downtown in particular is right, just 
take a walk after you leave here. You step over bodies. There's people laying everywhere. And um, it seems to be getting worse and worse and worse. I ran two years ago, it was bad. I'm running now, it's worse. I absolutely support the sit and lie ordinance and other ordinances that address behavior, not your financial situation. This is not about homelessness. This is not about being a transient. This is about behavior, and it's time we adopt a level of behavior that we can all agree with is proper for our community. Ms. Brown. No, I do not support the reinstatement of sit and lie. Uh, as mentioned, there was a, a local study done by Chico State professors using data provided by the Chico Police Department that demonstrated clearly that ordinances like sit and lie are ineffective in addressing what they set out to address, and they cost us in law enforcement response. I'd like to see those law enforcement resources used to address legitimate crime in our community. As it's also been mentioned, in stating uh, ordinances such as sit and lie restrict our access to available funding to address the issue of homelessness long term and uh, more holistically. Uh, I believe those resources, the resources we should be putting toward addressing the issue of homelessness should be going toward services which are more cost effective and more effective in addressing the issues that lead to homelessness and getting people um, to move forward with their lives. Thank you. And now another audience question. How can funding for Bidwell Park be increased? We will begin with Mr. Ober. I love this question. Um, I served for 10 years on the Bidwell Park and Playground Commission from 2004 to 2014. The, those years included 2008 and 2009 during the recession. Uh, during that time, we saw the park budget, the park division's budget absolutely decimated. As a commissioner, I argued as hard as I could that, that those were the wrong decisions. Uh, if we don't continue to invest in Bidwell Park, in our urban forest, in our street trees, we'll lose what we all know is really the heart and lungs of our community. We can't afford to do that. So we need to reprioritize and make sure that our uh, limited budget dollars are made available to protecting that resource. I think we should also explore other funding avenues. There are any number of uh, potential grants as well as foundation models that we could apply to protect and reinvest in Bidwell Park because when you ask people what they love most about Chico, often Bidwell Park is at the top of the list. Mr. Huber. So there was a proposal that's been floating around for the last six months or so. Matter of fact, it was asked by the uh, Parks Commission in a survey that they did, do you support a parking pass or a parking fee uh, to help support and maintain Bidwell Park? So I had this idea. I was up in Lassen Park a month ago, and Lassen Park Foundation was having a, a, a hike to the peak uh, event. Turns out, I did a little research, Lassen Park Foundation raises about $500,000 a year for Lassen Park. Now, I know that there are enough people, like probably a lot of the people up here, that enjoy their park, love their park enough, and have, know the value of their park, that they would be glad to be involved in a foundation where they paid an annual membership fee, where they went to a charity dinner once a year, where they bought a sticker and a T-shirt, and I think we could really go a long ways instead of mandating that people pay to park in the park. Mr. Galloway. So how do we increase funding? I hate, to, I hate to break the news, but we just don't have the dollars right now to increase funding. That, that may make me sound like the naysayer, and I absolutely recognize that this is one of the gems of our community. But I, I would propose that we invest through volunteerism, I saw a great effort on the Lindo Channel over the week, over the weekend. I, I think we all need to be stewards of our own park. I, I mentioned at another at another meeting, you know, maybe we can go through and find alternative methods for pulling invasives, alternative methods for policing our park. It, it kills me to hear people say that they don't feel safe in our park, as it is our our gym but we frankly don't have the money and we are underfunded in too many other places. Thank you. Mr. Coolidge. So I think the easy question is smart, 
financial management. Over the last 20 years, poor planning for the financial future of our city and unnecessary lawsuits have cost us literally millions and millions of dollars. We must have smart and intelligent financial planning as we move forward. I believe this council, and, and I give credit across the aisle as well, has moved forward in a very smart, fiscally sound way to look forward to the future and to put our city back on track. Obviously not at the speed we would like, but we are moving in that direction. And we have some huge successes too. Caper Acres being redone by groups of volunteers throughout our community is amazing, as well as what I was proud to bring to council was the tree planting program where we planted over 100 new trees to renew our tree stock in the park, lower park, as we move into the future. Mr. Rensing. Thank you. Uh, I would like to keep full funding for the park or continue to pursue full funding for the park and keep the park open to the public uh, and the access. Also, I don't think we ought to be looking at having fees to access the public park. If we're going to say that we need more money for the park, and as a number of folks have mentioned, the money doesn't exist in the budget. So you've either got to cut something else, and I'd ask you, what do you want to cut? Or we need to raise more fees, and how do you want to raise those? Given the current constraints on the budget, I don't see that there's any additional funding we could provide the park given the current constraints, but it should be a top priority for it to remain free and public access to everyone. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Well, I'm gonna go back to the, the prior subject, if you will, because it relates to park funding. We have out of control monster called unfunded pensions. It's growing larger than the revenue that's coming into the city. What that means is that short of fixing that pension problem, there will never be more money for the park or anything else. We have a cancer that is eating all the money. If we double the money, all we do is we put off the day that the cancer eats, eats us up. We have to look at the real problem. We solve that problem, we can probably find more money for the parks and all the other things that we really value in this community. We need to address the real economic crisis. It's unfunded pensions. That's why we don't have enough money for the park. Ms. Brown. As an avid park goer for the past 10 years, um, I, I can see the impact that having a gem like this in our community that is well maintained um, does, not only to increase the quality of life of the people who live here, but to invite tourism and to invite people to participate. I also believe that we can um, le leverage that beauty um, by uh, allowing opportunities for our community to invest in our parks. There are a variety of groups that actively use our parks that could host events and fundraisers and opportunities to um, bolster the funding available to address park maintenance. There are a number of volunteer-run organizations that maintain our parks, and I would be supportive of the projects that they uh, put forth in order to promote that. Um, and I think that we have an opportunity for some marketing efforts um, to allow our community to invest um, in a part of membership to uh, a, an association that, um, you know, that promotes the park and is supportive. Ms. Reynolds. As someone who lives a block from the park and walks in there daily, um, I, I'm not sure how we would actually physically do a fee with as many entries and how we would get everybody in and out. I don't even know how that would actually work. So I definitely don't support um, having a parking fee or anything like that. It, the, it's the gem of our city. It was given to us by Annie Bidwell, and we need to keep it that way, and we need to keep it access for everybody. Um, I donated last weekend to the Lassen Park Foundation, and last I heard that my ice cream little basket of a thing went for $2,900, which is just crazy to me. But this is the kind of stuff that they're raising in the private sector. They have Lassen Park Foundation. We have actual people in Chico that are on the Lassen Park Foundation. So I'm sure we could tap, tap into them. Um, I've found that we can do things a lot quicker in the private sector than we can get it th going through the city. So I think we'd have a lot faster way of getting money actually into our park by taking care of it through some sort of a foundation and um, private citizens doing it. Thank you. Thank you. Now a question from the league. 
Chico takes pride in being a true college town, yet students say they don't feel safe on our streets. What will you do about that? We will start with Mr. Huber. So there was a study done about a year ago and presented to the city council um, by university students regarding lighting in South Campus. And the students were, were really up in arms about the lack of street lighting in those neighborhoods. Um, so the first, th you know, and I don't know that anything's been done about it since then. I think that it's just kind of stalled out and we haven't really taken any action on it. So lighting would be a great start for making those neighborhoods safer. safer. Uh, a greater collaboration between the Chico PD and the university police would be a good thing. We have so much in common with the university and we miss so many opportunities to collaborate with them. Um, that would go a long ways for helping students to feel safer knowing that that South Campus area, which is, I went on a police ride along about uh, four months ago and we spent our whole evening in South Campus pretty much just busting up parties and taking beer away from people. So, thank you. Mr. Galloway. So safety within the community and safety within the college itself, both obviously paramount issues throughout. So the university needs, needs to help with their students as, we, as the Chico police needs to help as well. Clearly we benefit from having the university here. It's a huge economic boon. We, we, our city would be devastated if, if the university wasn't here. So we need to wear some of that responsibility and we do. I think we've all recognized over the past few months that the Street Crime Task Force did an amazing job when they didn't have to deal with the university. So trying to balance and communicate our roles between police department for the university and our local police department is critical. I know that, um, that the city management team is working with the, pre the president and Gail and, and, and trying to work through new ways and again, commun communication and understanding what the needs are are the critical components. Mr. Coolidge. So that study on the lighting in the South Campus neighborhood actually came out of the Internal Affairs Committee of the Chico City Council. And that was actually put in that issue into the Internal Affairs Committee because a student was killed at 7th and Chestnut where there was a yield sign. And the city, through actions of the council and what we push for, actually changed those yield signs to stop signs. And we have a lot of those yield signs. I'm sure everybody here watches people run through them all the time, and they're very dangerous for our city. And that's where the study was initiated out of, and it used Chico State students to make that study. And that is, and hopefully will be, as we continue forward, a priority for the city of Chico to work on those issues the students brought forward. And additionally, I would say that Chico PD and Chico State Police Department have enjoy currently the best relationship we ever have, and they do actually patrol our South Campus neighborhoods for us. Mr. Rinsink. Yes, I also think it would be a great idea to add some more lights in the South Campus area. Currently, Warner Street and Fifth Street are very well lit, have nice bike lanes, very safe access. But if you go a block one way or the other off those streets, and it's pretty dark, and uh, that's, that's just a recipe for, you know, accidents, bicyclists, cars, having the wrong kind of meeting. Uh, I also think that the Chico PD and the police department, or the Chico State Police, have been doing a great job coordinating. I would point to that I've had several conversations, a couple of conversations with Chief O'Brien, and he shares with me that if we go back and look at, say, 10 years ago, there were about uh, 80,000, 85,000 people in Chico, and we had 102 officers. Today, there's 10,000 more people in Chico, and in April, we had seven fewer officers. So if the population grows by 10,000, the police department shrinks by seven officers, uh, that's a recipe for more crime. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Well, God bless our students. Without them, we wouldn't be Chico. We'd probably be more like Orland. No, no insult to Orland, but uh, that's what makes this an awesome community. Uh, and I have news for all of you that's probably not news. Students aren't the only ones in Chico that are feeling unsafe on the streets. Pretty much the, the community at large is, isn't feeling safe on the streets. I can tell you that that's been a change. 40 years ago, I walked all of these streets at 3 or 4 in the morning, and 
I was never concerned. We need more police. We need to solve funding problems. Don't make me get on the pension issue again, but we need to solve our, our, our money problems so that we can get more police. That's, that's the job, really, of, of the leaders of the city, is to provide protection and, and the most basic services. And the police is at the top of the list. We need more of them. They do a great job, but, you know, one guy can't do the job of 50. Uh, I'm out of time. Sorry. <laughs> Ms. Brown. I was a student at Chico State, and I worked as an administrator on campus for the Violence Prevention and Response Program um, called Safe Place. So I did see the impact of um, student safety concerns and legitimate student safety concerns in that role as I was serving students who had experienced violence in our community. Um, I think it's important that we, uh, we fully staff our police force to ensure that, um, that the response to our community is, is well-rounded. I think I would support the collaborations between University Police Department and the Chico Police Department. And I would also be supportive of um, opportunities for students to engage with the community in new ways and to, um, to invest in the community through, through events and, and other safe opportunities. Um, the other piece of that is is that I think students feel like they're not being heard. I'd like to collaborate with students and talk with them about solutions that could be community driven to addressing safety concerns in our community and to collaborate with Chico State in that effort. Ms. Reynolds. We definitely need to um, keep our police department fully funded. Um, going backwards is not gonna help um, our community feel any safer. I have um, about 20 college students working for me and currently as of the last few months we've even had people going down and w escorting them to their cars and walking them, them to their cars at nighttime. So I get to see firsthand how these college students feel when it's dark and late and um, they're having to go out. As business owner, I've installed extra lighting so they feel safer, but it's we definitely do not want to go backwards. We need to fully fund our police department. We need to work with the fire, collaborate with the university police, and um, start buddy programs and talk to the students and find out what is going to work to make them feel safer. Um, I know they have programs in other communities where the older students that have been there longer and um, bigger guys help escort people home and make them feel safer, and I think anything we can do to make the students feel safer is what we need to do. Mr. Over. So I'd like to take this opportunity to kind of broaden our definition of safety just a bit. I agree, we need to improve lighting. Uh, we need to improve the walkways and uh, bike pathways. Um, I think we ought to explore both for uh, serving the Chico uh, uh, student neighborhoods as well as uh, downtown in general, increased foot patrols. Um, but I'd like to expand the defin just slightly, definition slightly and talk a little bit about safety as it relates to the sense of security. Um, the other thing that our uh, students are facing is both housing and food insecurity. And I think this sense of, of who they are in our community and their sense of feeling safe and embraced by the community expands in those areas, into those areas as well. And as a community, we need to step uh, step forward and partner with the university to address those issues. We have too many students who are facing uh, housing insecurity, who are sleeping in their cars. We have too many students who rely on the Wildcat Pantry. We need to address the broader issue of safety and security for Chico State. Thank you. Our next question is from the audience. How do you foresee the annexation of Chapman Town will proceed? We will begin with Mr. Galloway. So it's interesting. I, I worked with the Second Baptist Church four and a half years ago, designing a new facility for them that was going to tie into the sanitary sewer system that, that was being extended out into that region. So a lot of that infrastructure is already in place. Um, uh, the way that the annexation would work from there is the way that the annexations have worked uh, across the board. Some of our, some of my concerns with the way that annexation is going to work is obviously we have an overburdened police force as it is, and, and we want to do what we can to help them and support them in every way and fund them and, and increase our, our, our police force. But right now we don't have all the money to do that. So we're gonna inherit some pretty large sections of town at that location with a lot of people and, and unfortunately fairly high crime rates. 
And uh, it's, it's troublesome about how that's going to occur. They have the infrastructure, but they don't have safety. Mr. Coolidge. So when I came on the council, council was actually resisting um, taking Chapman into the city, though the state agency, well, the county agency, LAFCO, local agency, um, basically was putting forward that we had to do this. And under the threat of litigation, we moved forward on it. Uh, was it necessarily the best choice for Chico? No. Uh, a lot of those folks enjoyed being in the county. Um, but unfortunately, because the way LAFCO is designed, they are filling the holes within cities, and so we were forced to do that. So we need to prepare for those additional residents. Those are additional folks who are going to need police and fire protection, and we need to look towards filling those positions and making sure that we can provide them security within our community. Mr. Rensing. Yes, as uh, Councillor Coolidge mentioned, LAFCO has said we're going to have to do this eventually. It's probably the biggest island of county inside the city limits. It's going to become part of the city at some point. Now, yes, there are going to be costs associated with bringing that island into the city, but I think it's in the long-term best interest of both the city of Chico and the citizens of that area to be part of the city of Chico. It's up to us as counselors and leaders of the community to figure out the most effective and cost-efficient way to make that happen. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Well, politics does make some strange maps. The fact of it is Chapman Town is part of Chico, whether we call it the county or not, and ultimately it will be part of the city. What I hear is that we're going to need a lot of money, and if you drive through Chapman Town and look at the infrastructure, that's, that's pretty true. Um, but all the conversation here is the lack of money we have. So, you know, we can get private money, and the best way to get private money in there is to make it profitable for people to be in there. For example, we could maybe have tax benefits for uh, new construction. We could do things that allow uh, an upgrade in the things that we need to do in terms of sewer, sidewalks, curbs, um, by providing incentives to um, private individuals and companies to, to do these. Because any time that we can get uh, you know, the private money to do it, that, that's one less tax dollar that we don't have that we need to go looking for. Ultimately, it will be part of the city. Ms. Brown. As the other candidates have mentioned, this, this change is coming and we do need to be prepared for it. Uh, I, I, I want to learn more kind of about this process and what, and what it would take and um, this is an issue that I, I feel I need to learn more about. But I think as we're looking at this annexation, we need to look at the cost effective measures. Um, currently, uh, Chico Police and um, our fire department respond depending on who is closest. Um, and so we need to coordinate the efforts for public safety around, around response to the city. Um, also need to focus on hooking up our, um, our sewer now before the annexation because uh, long term that's going to be more cost effective uh, for our city in integrating the Chapman neighborhood into our community uh, further. Ms. Reynolds. I think proper planning is the um, definitely the key that's going to make this happen. It, it's coming down. It's, I've never understood. It, it's in the heart of our city. I've never understood why it's not part of the city. So it's obviously going to happen. I think that we need to um, plan for it and put the budget in place of whatever we need to do, continue to work with the police and fire to make sure we give them proper coverage in there. And I'm super hopeful that once they are annexed, a lot of times we see um, as the pricing, house, housing costs being so high in other places, we see people going in and rehabbing these old places. So I hope Chapman Town becomes a beauty and a part of our community and it's not that, oh, Chapman Town where they have a... Um, I don't know, what do you call it? Anyways, I hope that they can, we can build that area up and make it as beautiful as the rest of our city. Mr. Ober. Well, I think that we, we have people who are already um, working with the city and the county on these issues. So uh, I've been attending Love Chapman Town meetings for well over a year now. Uh, Love Chapman Town is a coalition of neighbors and activists in Chapman Town who have been advocating for the things that the people who are living in Chapman Town actually want out of annexation. 
I think it takes leadership at the city level to pay attention to that, be involved in that organization, attend those meetings, and actually listen to the things that that community is asking for. What I've heard them ask for are things like improvements on sidewalks to be able to be ADA compliant. As soon as you talk about that, there's potential for money that could be brought into that community to bring the, uh, those codes up to ADA compliance. Uh, they also talk about lighting. They talk about traffic controls. Uh, they talk about improving the right-of-ways that the kids who live in that neighborhood and walk to Chapman Elementary School and improving the safety there. We need to address these, uh, these issues in partnership with that neighborhood. Mr. Huber. So the Chapman community, and they hate the label Chapman Town, they prefer to be called the Chapman community, um, has been the redheaded stepchild of Chico for a century and a half, and they're not happy about it. They've been waiting for city services for a long, long time, and they want to be brought into this century with services. Not only that, but we disrespect them further by the continuation of a potentially toxic scrap metal yard uh, 100, 200 yards away from an elementary school and next to three or four houses that were built with the promise that that scrap yard would be moved. We owe Chapman community um, annexation and we owe it to them soon and we need to work on it with them. Thank you. Our next question is about commercial airline service. Chico lost commercial airline service a number of years ago. Do you support bringing back commercial airline service to Chico? And if so, what plans do you have to make that a reality? We'll start with Mr. Coolidge. So I said this four years ago, and I think it still holds true, what, what Chico needs and what will bring airline service is passengers. So we need the passenger studies for the airlines to show that we have a definite need for it. And the problem, the problem in the past was that the airlines that actually came to the city of Chico didn't fly necessarily on time, nor were they trustworthy in terms of where they were going because when they got to San Francisco, sometimes that airport, of course, was fogged in, those flights were delayed, people experienced terrible problems in terms of connecting flights, so it was very difficult. Um, we are currently looking at potential flight services. There's talk among the council of that now. I think it is very important for our long-term future. Uh, Reading is definitely beating us at this game, and I'd like to see us get ahead of that. And this is a very difficult answer in one minute, but um, there are a variety of ways that we can do that, and I look forward to exploring those. Mr. Rensink. Yes, uh, Chico does need air service. We did have air service until a few years ago. I believe it was like three flights a week or so down to the Bay Area. And for a town of our size of, you know, 80,000 folks to not have any outside air service just seems ridiculous. But, you know, the city council doesn't research and look at every aspect all on their own. That's what we have boards and commissions for. And I think that this issue would be more appropriately addressed by the Chico Airport Commission to really research this issue and bring some solutions to the city council that would be viable for the entire community. So that would be the approach I would take. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Well, you know, it's an economic issue. The reason that we don't have the air service that we most previously had is because they weren't making any money and uh, private businesses, as opposed to government, tend to go out of business when they don't make any money. So. Um, I think air service would be awesome to have in Chico. What we need to do is provide incentives that allow, um, you know, flight companies to have a shot at making a few bucks. If we do that, air service will come back. If we don't, um, you know, people are going to look at the history and say, well, that's a, that's a, that's a money loser. They're not going to come. It's got to be profitable. What we can do on the city council is try and find ways to make it easier to be profitable for air service to be in Chico. That's Ms. it. Ms. Brown. 
Yes, I, I fully support the reinstatement of commercial air service in Chico. Um, it's essential for the growth of our businesses, the growth of our, stu um, our student population, and for bringing tourism to the area. Uh, it really is about sustaining that, and in the past we have not been able to do so. Um, I, I'm forgetting the terminology, but essentially we could, um, I believe it's called a ticket bank, where uh, businesses uh, purchase a certain amount of tickets to guarantee flights um, so that those flights are full. Um, um, and to sustain those flights long term. Um, and I would love to you know, continue those collaborations through the airport commission and on the city council with airlines to try to um, incentivize them to start in our area and uh, work with them to create long term solutions. Ms. Reynolds. I think it'd be great to have air back here. Um, I absolutely would love to drive 10 minutes instead of driving an hour and a half or down to Sacramento or three hours to um, San Francisco. Um, being a business owner that's open to business and now opened a second business, I also know that if you want to stay in business, you got to make money. So I think that when the airlines can be profitable and that when there's enough passengers to fill the planes and that we will have people fighting to come back for here for air, or for air? Air too, but to fly. Um, so I think if we're friendly, if we have a friendly business environment where we're continually drawing business here, where we're continually increasing um, the revenue coming in here, and we have more and more places like Build.com and Third Love and Sierra Nevada Brewery and all these great places and providing great jobs, then we're going to have more people to be on those flights to make it affordable. And I think it's super important also where we tie to. Um, that we're going direct somewhere that's actually where people want to go, be it San Jose, LA, whatever, and maybe missing the fog in San Francisco might get rid of having so many delays. Mr. Ober. <clears throat> well, I, I've spent 24 years working in the technology sector here in Chico for local, private, homegrown companies, two software companies. I spent a lot of years flying in and out of uh, Chico Municipal Airport, as did all my colleagues. The loss of that service has been an economic hit. Uh, we do need to restore that, and this is a place where, again, I believe that some new creative leadership needs to be brought to bear at the city council level. Um, the travel bank is the way that communities of our size all over the country um, have attracted airlines and air service into communities of our size. Um, the airport commission has been talking about establishing a travel bank. I think that's absolutely essential to restoring air service. It's also, once, as many people have said, once we have that uh, industrial uh, um, growth tool at our service, uh, we will see more people moving in, uh, to Chico and joining uh, companies that are doing the technology work that I've spent my, my career doing. Mr. Huber. So I currently work at build.com, um, 600 employees on Otterson Drive. Um, we have reps manufacturers reps coming in a couple of times a week and they're having to fly into Sacramento and rent a car and drive to Chico. And I just wonder how long the company's going to endure that before they decide that another state or another city is going to make more sense for them. So there was a study done recently of the Chico Metropolitan Service Area, which includes Oroville, Paradise, Gridley, and Chico. It determined that we had enough uh, pent up demand to fill two inbound and two outbound planes a day, which equaled 682 passengers. I fully support the airport manager's work on bringing a commercial airline to Chico, and I'm very interested in JetBlue's plan to potentially um, privately finance a new terminal. Mr. Galloway. So I was a frequent user of our commercial air service and a frequent recipient of getting stranded in San Francisco <laughs> and trying to find a way back. Uh, anyway, I, I support having the, the service. I can't support a for-profit commercial uh, airline coming in at the expense of our non-profit city. So what do we do then to get the air service in here? We do what we can to be predictable for business and we encourage as much business as we can get to come into Chico. Developing that user base to, to utilize the, air, the, air, the airline would, uh, is what's gonna make it profitable for that airline to come in. And so as we start hearing numbers about 682 people a day, 
those numbers are going to take care of themselves, and they're going to come here to be a for-profit industry. I just can't. I, I just can't do it at the expense of our city funds. Thank you. In order to end on time, this will be our last question, and it's from the league. What would be your top two priorities if elected? And we will begin with Mr. Rensing. My top two priorities would be public safety and working on balancing the budget. Everything eventually comes down to money, one way or another. And we're gonna have to make some hard choices. I served two terms on the Planning Commission. I'm used to making hard choices. I'm also used to explaining to folks how I arrived at my decisions. I don't shy away from the tough decisions. We've got to address the finances of the city, the pension, you know, <laughs> blade that's hanging over the city's neck. It, it, it's, a, it's a ticking time bomb, John, and we've got to address these issues. So I support having a budget that looks at our priorities of public safety, but then we also need to support the other aspects of the city, you know, parks, libraries, et cetera. Thank you. Mr. Scott. Well, there's lots of priorities, but you've asked for two. Number one is public safety. Clearly, we could use more police. We have students that are afraid to walk at night. We have citizens that are afraid to walk at any time. Um, so public safety without question. The other one is pension reform. We can keep not talking about it. We can keep pretending it's not going to happen, but it will. Um, that's it. Two priorities, public safety, pension reform. Let's talk about real issues instead of having endless debates with that, while ignoring the 800-pound elephant in the room, as they say. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Thank you. <clears throat> Public safety is also a number one priority for me. But coming from a social service background, I have a, a different perspective about what's included in public safety. I believe that our definition of public safety needs to be expanded, not just to include our police force, but to include collaborations and prioritize collaborations with service providers. Uh, we cannot expect our police force to act as social workers, but we can enhance those collaborations to get people connected to the support that they need and to support our service providers in not only intervening in issues that can lead to crime, but in preventing them from happening. The second priority is a grouping of three, housing, homelessness, and behavioral health. We need to address our housing crisis by increasing our affordable housing stock. We need to avail ourselves to the funding that's available to address homelessness through shelter services and um, behavioral health services. And we need to increase coordination uh, with our service providers to ensure that those services are offered um, effectively. Ms. Reynolds. Top two priorities for me, number one, public safety. Um, that it's just absolutely crucial and we need to continue to go forward and um, keep the staff and fire department and police department fully staffed and able to function at the level that they need to so we all have a great and safe um, place to live in. And fiscal responsibility. We can't staff those things and do that if we aren't being fiscally responsible and taking care of working towards the pension reform, working on our ready day fund, and taking care of all the things that we need to do. Thank you. Mr. Ober. Uh, top two priorities, I would start with housing. Um, we need to increase our housing stock in general, we need to increase our single resident unit stock, and we need desperately to increase our affordable housing. We need to declare a shelter emer emergency. Uh, we need a 24-7 restroom so that we can alleviate some of the problems that downtown business uh, owners and property owners are facing and so that we can actually care for the people who need so desperately to have services provided. So housing and homelessness is number one. Public safety, of course, but I'm going to actually talk about Bidwell Park. I think that we need to reinvest in the heart and lungs of our city. And that takes readjusting priorities, finding creative funding solutions so that we can care for our, our urban forest, so that we can reinvest in our street trees, and so that we can care for all of our public parks, including Bidwell Park at its core. Mr. Huber. 
So I believe homelessness is the biggest issue facing our community right now, but when we talk about homelessness, I think we need to separate out criminality first because it tends to get lumped together all the time. And there are criminals in houses and there are criminals without houses. We need to prosecute criminality to the fullest extent of the law. So burglaries, break car break-ins, bike thefts, vandalism, petty theft, uh, sexual assault, violent crimes, let's throw the book at those people. At the same time, let's acknowledge that seniors and veterans and families with children who don't make enough to both pay the rent and eat are not criminals. And people with diseases and mental and physical disabilities cannot be lumped into the category of crime when we don't have enough housing for them. So what are the solutions? This, oh, I'm already done, okay. <laughs> Mr. Galloway. I was on the edge of my seat. <laughs> Next yeah, next week. Tune in next week. All right, so I'm using up my time. Sorry, public safety, number one. Support our police officers, support our fire departments. Do what we can to help create a safe community. And that safety is going to work back into my next part, which is economic growth. Because I think if we create a, a predictable and understandable environment for businesses as they're coming and looking to, to approach and come to Chico and looking to attract new talent to Chico, Safety weighs right back into that, right? And an, and an attractive community weighs right back into that. So if we can develop places and, and, and methods to bring business to Chico, those tax dollars and those people who come here generating tax dollars are going to help pay taxes to get into the general plan to get us out of some of the trouble that we're at from a financial basis. So and, and all of the questions we talked about tonight really tie back into having a vibrant community. Mr. Coolidge. So I, I would say Mr. Scott is not wrong at all. Pensions are a huge issue facing the city of Chico and one that we must start looking at. Um, in terms of my, well, and we have started looking at, to be honest, in, in an investment fund. Um, top priorities, and I think they should be everybody's. They're probably everybody's in this room. You want a well-run financial city and you want public safety. Beyond that, we all want the other things. We want parks, we want uh, nice roads, we want all those other things. But I think public safety is certainly number one and a budget that's maintained. That is the job of the city council. There are two jobs of a councilor. One is to review and approve a budget and the other is to make policy. And I believe we have a path forward on policy that'll include things like uh, the mayor's community court, the consolidation of services with the Jesus Center, and some of the ordinances I put forth through the Chico Safe Now proposals. Thank you. Thank you all for your thoughtful answers. It is now time for closing statements. Mr. Ober, you may begin with your one minute closing statement. Well, thank you again to the League and to all of you for being with us tonight. Um, Kate and I moved to Chico 24 years ago. Uh, we, spent, we have spent those 24 years being involved in various boards and commissions and organizations because this is the kind of place that invites you to get involved with your community. Uh, we recognize that immediately and it's been our passion for the, for the 24 years we've lived here. We've raised two amazing kids in Chico uh, and we're so proud of where they are today. I spent 10 years on the Park Commission. I spent nearly that long on the Gateway Science Commission uh, uh, organization, the Gateway Science uh, Museum. And I've spent four years on the Board of Directors for the Torres Community Shelter. I have a spirit of collaboration and communication and open dialogue that is so desperately needed to what we all know is broken in our community. We need to improve how we talk to each other, and that's what I'm about. Mr. Huber. So I've never been a watcher. I've always been a doer. That's why when I realized I didn't know enough about the homeless situation, I spent 48 hours on the streets, I slept in the tourist shelter, I took my meals at the Jesus Center, I slept in, uh, in uh, Lindo Channel, and the following week, I went on a police ride along so I could discover what their side of that picture was like. The following week, I accompanied our downtown ambassadors to see what it was like to wake up homeless people downtown in the morning. 
When I wanted to learn more about cannabis, which is an issue that's going to be coming before us, I flew to Boulder, Colorado for two days. I spent uh, a day with the uh, city employees there and a day with the Chamber of Commerce and I toured the dispensaries. When it came time to figure out housing affordability, I organized a housing forum here in town. I had 70 attendees and I had a panel made up, made up of developers, contractors, housing advocates and housing experts. I will be a doer on your city council. Thank you. Ms. Reynolds. Thank you, League of Women Voters. Thank you um, to the community for coming out. I know there's probably a lot of other things you'd rather be doing on a Monday night, but it's super important part of our civic engagement that we do this. Um, I have loved this community. I'm the fourth generation owner of one of the oldest businesses in Chico. I would love to be able to take all the um, education and stuff that I've learned over the years running that business and take it to the city council level. Um, I too would love to bring a better level of communication and civility and in this um, that we're having right now. Uh, after everything that we had last weekend, I'm sorry, it's still a little shaky after the last weekend. Um, we can't threaten our families. We can't threaten each other as candidates. It's super important that we come to the table, that we have open conversation and we collaborate, come together, and talk to each other about solutions. Um, I think it's, that's what's going to be important to, for the city to tackle these really big problems that we have ahead of us, and I'd be honored to serve as your next councilwoman. Mr. Rinsink. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for providing this forum. You might ask, what is Ken Rinsink going to do for you if elected to the city council? My answer is simple. If elected, I will bring an independent and experienced voice to the council. I served two terms on the Chico Planning Commission. The first time I was appointed by a liberal majority council. The second time I was appointed by a conservative majority council. I'm honored that folks across the political spectrum seem to recognize and support my approach. You know, there's too much uh, money in politics today and political party partisanship. I only accept contributions from individuals for a maximum of $100. This is my commitment to remain free from political party and big money pressure. With your help, we can bring a real independent voice to the city council. Learn more at KimForChico.com. Thank you. Mr. Coolidge. So always good to be here at my alma mater, and I appreciate the League and Chico State for hosting this forum today. Uh, the city of Chico has a yearly budget over, of, of over $100 million. It is important that we have capable, informed, and proven leaders to do the job of a city councilor. We learned all too well about the financial harm of not preparing for the future and not having a council that is keenly aware of these issues. I have been proud to serve my community and make public safety my number one priority, putting forth issues that provide help for those who need it and accountability for those who commit crimes against our citizens. I am proud to have these issues being discussed at the council level and by our community. My name is Andrew Coolidge and I'm asking for your support in this upcoming election and thank you for this opportunity. Ms. Brown. Thank you again to the League and to my fellow candidates for participating in this forum and in this process. Um, as you probably have gathered, my background is in social services. What makes me unique as a candidate for Chico City Council is that I've looked at these issues from a direct service perspective, from a prevention perspective, and from an administrative perspective. All of these experiences will directly influence my ability to implement policy in a smart, strategic, and sustainable way for our city. I'm, I decided to stay here after attending Chico State because I'm invested in this community and I'm involved in this community and I'm ready to use my skills to move this, this city fo forward. I'm Alex Brown. Please visit my website at alexbrownforcouncil.com and I'll look forward to talking about my experience and the issues with you more. Thank you so much. Mr. Scott. Voters, if your criteria for the three candidates you're going to vote for are people that care about Chico, You've got a pretty tough job because you've got eight people up here that, that care deeply about this city. That being said, um, there may be some cases where I'm, I'm definitely not your candidate. If you believe that the pension crisis will solve itself if we just kind of ignore it, kind of, kind of hope that we have some good luck, 
kind of hope this awesome economy keeps going. I'm not your candidate. If you believe that we will solve the transient crisis by building them all a, a little house uh, and giving them everything that, uh, that they need to, uh, to live comfortably, well, I'm probably not your candidate. On the other hand, uh, you've heard some of my views tonight, and if they, if they seem to be going your way, well, then possibly I'm, I'm one of those three votes that you want to make. I appreciate every one of you. I thank you for listening to me. Have an awesome night. Mr. Galloway. Thank you, everyone, for being here this evening. I'm going to sound like a broken record. You've probably seen it. Safe, affordable, and attractive. Let's talk about each one. Safety. Support our police department, support our fire department, and support public works to do the things that they need to do for a safe community. That doesn't necessarily mean monetarily. It means with policies and rules. Affordable. We've talked a lot. I personally haven't talked too much about it, but I have a tremendous amount of experience with affordable housing. But I think that afford it goes beyond housing. We need to talk about affordability for businesses because the cost that a business pays in rent is what we pay for milk, what we pay for a loaf of bread, what we pay to visit our favorite restaurant. And we need to be, we need to be attractive to those businesses to come to Chico. So as we talk about attractive uh, beyond the architectural sense, right, because I've, I've spent 25 years trying to make a beautiful place, I want to make a place that's in incentivized for business, that's good for families, and it's good for students. Thank you. On behalf of the League of Women Voters of Butte County, I want to thank all of the candidates for participating in this forum for City Chico City Council. The audience may now applaud. Mm -hmm. There will now be a 10-minute break while the candidates for the Chico Unified School District Board of Trustees take their places on the stage.